Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I'm really looking forward to hearing your opinions on. I have my own opinions, but I know that there will be people on both sides that believe different things. So I'm really interested to hearing what all of you think about this case. But no matter which side you're on, this is definitely a very tragic case. But before we get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. Native is one of my favorite sponsors here on this channel because I have been using their products for literally years now and they have never failed to impress me. I love Native because it's so important to me to be aware of what I'm putting in and on my body. Their deodorants are always aluminum-free, paraben-free, vegan, and cruelty-free with familiar and simple ingredients like coconut oil and shea butter. Native's plastic-free deodorant now comes in new and improved 100% plastic-free, earth-friendly packaging. Using their same amazing formula, it still goes on smooth as butter and dries very quickly and lasts literally all day. I just got back from a camping trip and let me tell you, my Native deodorant came in clutch on the days where I was hiking literally literally all day, ready to take a shower, and then you pull up to your campsite and lo and behold, there's no shower. My native deodorant literally lasted me for days at a time, keeping me smelling fresh and clean my entire trip. The scents that I have are lavender and rose, which if you are a regular viewer of this channel, you know that this is my absolute favorite scent. It just has the most amazing floral scent that is the perfect balance of fresh and sweet, but not too sweet. Then I have this lilac and white tea one, which is definitely getting up there to being one of my new favorites. It's also a floral smell, but it has just a bit of that soapy fresh smell as well. And then I have Cotton and Lily, which is another amazing scent. This one reminds me of like a powdery everyday scent. This is one of their sensitive deodorants, which means that it's made without baking soda for those of you with extra sensitive skin. I like to use this one on the days after I shave because my skin is literally raw after I shave and I have very sensitive skin on those days. So I need to make sure I'm using the right products for my skin's needs on that particular day. Another amazing thing about Native is that they are committed to celebrating the LGBTQ community. They've been able to donate $50,000 to the Trevor Project, which is the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for the LGBTQ young people. I love a company that not only puts out amazing products, but uses some of their profits to support really important organizations. Now, normally three plastic free deodorants goes for $39, but if you use the link in my description box below and use code RachelShannon9, you can get your three pack for only $26, which is 33% off. Also, with my link and my code, you can get 20% off of any of their other products, including their body wash and their toothpaste, which I also love. They're also amazing, and I use them literally every single day. So again, make sure you click a link in my description box below and use code RachelShannon9 to get 33% off of your three-pack of native deodorant or 20% off of any of their other products. Thank you again so much to Native for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the deaths of April and Mike Holton. April Diane Owen B. Holton was born on Christmas Eve in 1978, and her adoptive parents were Joy and Charles Owen B. Now, April was reported to have a bit of a rough childhood. She started life by watching both her mother and father using drugs and alcohol, and her mother would sometimes leave her and her two younger twin brothers for prolonged periods of time. It got to the point that they were no longer able to take care of April or her brothers, Chris and Michael, so all of the kids ended up in the foster care system for a period of time. Growing up, she did what she could to help take care of her little brothers. She would change their diapers and feed them. She basically did whatever she could to help raise her little brothers whenever they were in the system. Eventually, though, April and her brothers did live with their grandparents, Mary and Enos, who did ultimately get custody of all three children. However, However, raising three young children proved to be too much for them to handle given that they're an older couple at this time. So they opted to get assistance from the Alabama Baptist Children's Home Association. Chris and Michael were placed with the Ombi family while April stayed with her grandparents. But by the time she was nine, she did ultimately join her brothers to live with the Ombi family. 
Here, April seemed to thrive and do extremely well with her new family and her new community in eclectic Alabama. She went to Elmore County High School where she played in the band. She was the saxophone section leader as well as the assistant drum major. While in high school, she met a man named Jesse Michael Holton who went to school with her and he went by his middle name, Mike. Mike Holt was born June 3rd, 1979 and he also grew up in eclectic. He was a musician at the time and the two became infatuated with each other very quickly. He and April started dating during their senior year of high school at age 17 and they were described by others as having fallen for each other hard and fast. The two graduated from high school in 1997 and quickly became married at the age of 19 years old. Mike went on to become a firefighter and he also spent some time serving in the National Guard. He went on to become the chief of Eclectic Fire Department and he was a certified fire instructor. When 9-11 happened, he traveled to New York to help out with the disaster. He also served as the mayor of Eclectic from 2012 to 2014. He retired from the position after citing family issues, which we will get more into later. Those around him, though, said that he devoted his life to serving others in his community. Him and April went on to have three children together, Madison, Hayden, and Kyle. April was able to be a full stay-at-home mother while Mike continued to work. Both were described as being very involved in doting parents. Mike became the little league coach for both the football and baseball teams, and April could always be found in the stands watching and supporting her sons as they played their favorite sports. Those around them described them as seeming to have the perfect family life. However, by 2016, it seemed that April and Mike's marriage was starting to crumble. There were a lot of problems in their marriage behind the scenes that ultimately led them to filing for divorce in 2016. Now, going back just a bit, because of her rough upbringing, April had absolutely no tolerance for drug use within her home. She knew the harms that could come with addiction, and so she just didn't want her family to face the same hardships that she had to growing up. However, in 2006, Mike had actually sustained a back injury while he was at work. He went to the doctor who did prescribe him pain medications, but the doctor told him that the only real way that his back is going to heal is by resting. However, it seemed that Mike was not interested in taking a rest. He continued to push through work by continuously taking his pain medication. And as it happens in so many of these types of situations, Mike became dependent on his pain medication and his addiction grew out of control. Mike did everything he could to hide his drug use from his family, but he was spending so much more money to support his drug habit than his family was aware of. By the time April found out what was going on, their family was in a lot of financial trouble, but this isn't what ended their marriage. April found out all of this and all she wanted to do was help him. She did everything she could to try and stop this addiction, but Mike would continuously tell her that he had things under control while hiding exactly how bad things were getting. By 2014, it got so bad to the point where they started to fall behind on their mortgage payments and their home actually went into foreclosure. And this is actually what caused them to have to move and why he retired as mayor in 2014. During all of this though, so April tried to do what she could to make their marriage work. However, their oldest son, Jesse, who went by his middle name of Madison, he started to have some issues of his own, which made things even more difficult for the family. He was diagnosed with ADHD and his doctor had prescribed him some medication to treat it. Now, for those of you who don't know, ADHD is treated with stimulant medication such as Adderall or Ritalin. These medications can be highly addictive, so you have to be very, very careful with them. Of course, April was really concerned with this at first, but Madison said that he didn't even want to take this medication because he didn't like how they made him feel. So things were okay for a while, but by the time he turned 16, April had found out that he did start using marijuana. While April was very worried and upset about this, Mike was much less interested in punishing Madison for using weed. He would basically say that, you know, it's just pot, it's not a big deal. A lot of teenagers get into using marijuana, which is kind of true. But I can definitely see April's side where her parents fell into it so hard and so did Mike, and she had to watch all of these people around her fall into drug use. So 
So I can definitely see why she would have a lot of anxiety when her son started to use marijuana. This was an issue that April and Mike just could not seem to resolve or agree on. And with the combination of everything else that was going on in their lives, April just couldn't take it anymore. By April of 2016, April and her three sons moved out of the family home and into a new home in a nearby town. And then by August, she had filed for divorce. After this, as Madison was living with his mother, April told him that if he continued to use drugs, that he would no longer be allowed to live in her home. April said that if he continued using drugs, that he would be kicked out and had to live with his dad, but he did continue using weed behind her back. But not only that, it seemed that he was helping his father obtain drugs as well. After finding out about Madison's drug use, he realized that obviously Madison had to be getting drugs from somebody else. Obviously, he had connections with someone else. So he asked Madison if he could actually get the drugs for him and Madison agreed. Madison started to provide his father with drugs without April's knowledge. So of course he didn't mind that he was gonna be living with his dad. But as far as I was able to see as all of this was happening behind the scenes, it seemed that Mike had given April the impression that he no longer was okay with Madison's drug use. He agreed that some of his behaviors had grown out of control. So according to what April thought at that time, Mike was not allowing Madison to use drugs within his home. Also, I don't know how true it is that Madison truly was getting drugs for Mike. I don't know if this was a confirmed fact or if it was just a rumor, so I wanted to point that out as well. As all of this was going on at the same time, it seemed that Mike was not handling the separation well. Obviously, this type of thing is very difficult for everybody. The two had been together since they were teenagers, so they basically grew up together and they really only knew what life was like as a couple. Mike was afraid that April would want to date somebody else and he did express this fear to one of their mutual friends. However, he was reassured that April was just working on her life and all she wanted to do was focus on raising her kids and making sure that all of them were okay through all of this. Now, on September 11th, 2016, April had received a phone call from the mother of one of Madison's friends to let her know that 17-year-old Madison had thrown a party at Mike's house the night before, so on September 10th. The friend's mother explained to April that she knew that this party involved marijuana at least, if not other drugs, and she expressed that she was very upset that her son had attended Madison's party. And of course, April was immediately upset, so she headed straight over to Mike's house to deal with the situation. As she was on her way, the friend's mom also gave Mike a phone call. Now, apparently the night before, as the party was going on, Mike was working one of his shifts as a firefighter. I don't know if it's the same for all fire departments, but I do have a family member who has worked for various fire departments, and typically they have 24-hour shifts. So they'll start their shift, let's say, at 5 a.m. on a Monday, and then not be home until 5 a.m. the next day on a Tuesday. So that is plenty of time for a teenager to throw a party without their parents' knowledge. So Mike Mike explained to the friend's mom that he hadn't been home all day or night and at the time of this phone call he had just been getting back home so he hadn't seen anything yet. When he did get home though he walked in and saw that his home was absolutely trashed and it was obvious that a party had taken place there. There was marijuana paraphernalia and alcohol bottles laying all around but Madison was nowhere to be found. So Mike texted Madison to get his butt home and he quickly got there. I can't even imagine like being a teenager, getting this text from your parents and be like, oh crap, I need to get home right now or I'm gonna be in even more trouble. So he got home pretty much immediately. And once he got there, Mike had handcuffed Madison in that moment to sort of punish him for throwing this huge party at his own house while he was at work. Shortly after, April had arrived at Mike's house to see Madison sitting on the couch in handcuffs. At this time, Mike called the police who showed up at 4.28 p.m., when they arrived, they also saw Madison, who was still sitting on the couch in handcuffs, looking upset and sullen. So the officers spoke to each individual involved in this, and they took pictures of the house. 
It was obvious to the officers as well that a party had been thrown and that Madison was an underage teenager who had partaken in use of drugs and alcohol. So April and Mike followed this officer out to the car while Madison stayed inside. They asked the officer if they could get a juvenile warrant signed so that he would have to stand in front of a judge and Madison would have to accept responsibility for his actions. So since it was a Sunday at the time and they wouldn't be able to stand in front of a judge until a Monday, Mike agreed agreed to drive Madison to the station so that they could sign the juvenile warrant and that he would be able to stand in front of a judge on that Monday. According to the officer, Mike and April were getting along very well at this time and they were on the same page about punishing Madison and what consequences he should be accepting for this. By the time the officer left, about 20 minutes later at 4.48 p.m., April and Mike went back inside and Madison was still sitting on the couch, still in handcuffs. However, only 11 minutes after this officer had left their home, 911 received another phone call. This time, it was a neighbor who said that Madison had run over to their house, still in handcuffs, concerned about the safety of his mother. Madison had apparently told this neighbor that his parents went into their bedroom and started arguing. He said that this turned into a physical altercation and he heard his mother starting to yell for help. He told the neighbor that he knew that his father had a gun in the house and he was afraid for his mother's life. Less than five minutes after receiving this call, the same officer returned back to the house and when he walked into the master bedroom, he saw a horrific scene. He saw that both Mike and April were laying on the ground surrounded by pools of blood the officer also found a 9mm semi-automatic pistol laying on the ground near Mike's feet. Mike was deceased at the scene, but April was still alive, just barely clinging to life. So, of course, she was put into an ambulance and she was rushed to the hospital. She was put on life support, but unfortunately, she did die at the hospital that following night. Of course, after seeing this horrific scene, police immediately wanted to speak with Madison to get his account of what happened. He told the officer that after he had left, the officer had left, his parents went into the master bedroom, leaving Madison still handcuffed on the couch. He said that they closed the door behind them and they started having a very loud argument when he suddenly heard his mother screaming for help. He said that as soon as he heard this, he busted into the room by kicking down the door. He said that this is when he saw his father holding his mother in a chokehold with a gun pointed towards her head. He said that after saying this, he immediately left and he grabbed two cell phones on the way out and he ran straight to his neighbor's house to get help. Now, initially upon assessing the scene, police believed that this was a murder-suicide at the hands of Mike Holt. However, there were a few different things about this whole situation that made investigators wonder if this wasn't all that it seemed. They wondered if maybe Madison was actually the one who was responsible for shooting and killing both of his parents. So now let's discuss the different reasons why police believed that Madison may have actually been responsible for the death of April and Mike. So first, Madison had told police that he saw all of this going down by kicking down the door and busting into the room. However, police had found no sign that the door had actually been kicked in or damaged in any way. Next, according to the neighbor, after Madison ran over to his house to get help, the neighbor went over to the house, obviously in a hurry to check out the scene but Madison stayed behind and instead smoked a cigarette as the neighbor went in. He said that he knocked on the door of the house, but all he could hear was April's faint cries for help. He said that he walked in and that is when he found both of them shot. All the while, Madison was somewhere else just smoking a cigarette and didn't seem as concerned as he should have been. Then police also said that his demeanor was very off. They said that he was unusually calm for someone who had just witnessed all of this happen. They did immediately do a gunshot residue test on his hands, which did come back as negative, but the officer said that sometimes the gun that was used in this case might not leave behind a gunshot residue. Now, Madison was still handcuffed by the time officers arrived on the scene, so to some, this might point towards him not being responsible because how could he have shot his parents if his hands were behind his back? But police saw that there was clearly a key sitting on the living room table, so they thought that he could have easily grabbed the key, let himself free, 
done this crime and then put himself back in handcuffs before he ran over to the neighbor's house to make it look like he couldn't be responsible. So based on their initial suspicions and the fact that this entire situation just seemed really off and really odd, they detained Madison and decided to hold him on his drug paraphernalia charges after, you know, this house party. As this was happening, of course, April and Mike's bodies were both sent to the medical examiner for their autopsies. And this is when the medical examiner actually ruled that both Mike and April's cause of death was homicide. So that means that according to this ME report that Mike did not in fact shoot himself, that both of them were shot by somebody else. To police, this confirmed their suspicions that Madison had something to do with this because he was the only one in the house at that time and he was the only one that could have been responsible. So Mike had actually been shot at the base of the left side and the back of his head with the bullet exiting through the right front side of his head. So police said that he would have had to hold the gun in his left hand and then angle it upwards in the back to have actually shot himself. But Mike was actually right-handed, so it didn't really make sense to them that he would have chose to use his non-dominant hand and then shoot himself at a very odd and unusual angle. Then the autopsy found that April had been shot on the top of her head on the right side, and she also had a gunshot wound to one of her fingers, which showed that she had been shot as she was trying to cover her head. So basically, what we can get from this is that it kind of doesn't make sense that if Mike was holding the gun in his left hand that he would have shot April on the right side and then him on the left if this was all happening in very quick succession and he was just shooting wherever he could it would have been easier for him to shoot her on the left side of the head so you know, doesn't make sense that he would switch hands. So this all kind of points to him not being responsible. But I will mention that both of these gunshot wounds to both April and Mike were close contact wounds. So after reading this autopsy report, these injuries pretty much confirmed to police that Madison had to be the one responsible for shooting both of his parents. After all, this all took place within 11 minutes after the officer left their home. Plus, you know, Madison was the only one within the home who had the opportunity to shoot them. And then to them, it seems that he also had a motive. He was probably very upset with his parents for punishing him after throwing this party. So all of this together really made police believe that Madison had to be responsible. Then police noted that in the days after being arrested, he showed no emotion or no remorse for his parents' deaths. They said that he did not show an ounce of emotion the entire time. They said that he was more concerned about his school's homecoming than about his parents dying. He just kept talking about all these events at school that he was going to have to miss and then talking about girls that he had been hanging out with rather than being concerned about his parents literally just dying. They also said that he had a history of pretty severe emotional problems. They said that he was very easily agitated if he didn't have immediate access to his weed or his Adderall. Witnesses also came forward to confirm that Madison did have a history of anger issues. Then police obtained a recorded phone call that Madison had made while he was in jail. During this call, he had asked the person on the other line what all of the girls that he had slept with thought about his arrest. He said, quote, like the people I slept with, like what do they think about it right now? Like, oh damn, I effed a murderer. And obviously this sounds pretty bad and this sounds like he is in fact admitting that he's a murderer. So based on all of this, a preliminary hearing was held to review all of the evidence to see if there was enough evidence to bring this to a grand jury. Again, they discussed that both April and Mike's deaths were ruled as homicides. Then they discussed his calm behavior and these bizarre statements that he made while in jail. Based on this, the judge determined that there was enough evidence to go to a grand jury on these two murder charges. He was initially determined to be a dangerous person, so his bail was set to $1 million, but it was lowered by December of 2017 after he had spent an entire year in jail. His uncle actually posted his bail and he was released from jail. During this entire time, through everything that was happening, I do believe that his brothers really did think that he was responsible for killing both of his parents. They were very resentful towards him and they did not want him present at their parents' funeral. Mike's side of the family also believed that Madison was responsible for all of this. But throughout everything, April's family, including her parents and siblings, had 
always been supportive of Madison and they truly believed that he was not responsible. His trial was set to start in October of 2018 and in the meantime, both sides would continue to investigate to argue their sides. There were two main theories. Either Madison killed both of his parents or he witnessed his father shooting his mother and then Madison shot his father for revenge. However, the more information that was uncovered, the more questions that were raised, there were a lot of problems with the initial theory that Madison was responsible for murdering both of his parents. First, we know that these gunshots were determined to have been done at close range. However, Madison had very minimal, if any amounts of blood on his clothing. If he were close to his parents when he had shot them, there would have been a significant amount of blood on his shirt. You could argue that maybe he changed his clothing before running over to his neighbor's house, but then you have to remember that all of this occurred within 11 minutes from the time that the officer had left to the time that Madison arrived on his neighbor's doorstep. And then again, with the whole 11 minutes thing, we have to consider other things. Within this 11 minutes, he would have had to search the home and find his father's gun. Even if he knew exactly where it was, he would have had to go get it. And then he would have had to uncuff himself and then shoot his parents after all of this was happening and then clean himself up, change his clothes, and then hide his clothes clothing somewhere that no one would ever find it and then recuff himself and then run over to his neighbor's house within 11 minutes. That just does not seem very plausible. Plus, this also brings up the fact that I have not seen it mentioned anywhere if he was wearing the same clothing when the cop originally saw him. So obviously, if it was the same cop who was there before and after, he would know exactly what clothes Madison was wearing. He would have noticed if he changed, and I did not see that mentioned anywhere. So I would assume that he was wearing the same clothing because I feel like that would have been a really big thing that police would have pointed to if he did change his clothing. Maybe he was wearing a white t-shirt and he happened to have two white t-shirts. I don't really know, but either way, this all just does not seem very plausible to me. Now I want to talk about things that were found in the autopsy that were not initially mentioned when Madison was charged. So first, the toxicology report that Mike had multiple substances within his system when he died. He had hydrocodone, oxycodone, tramadol, and decimethyltramadol in his system. He was clearly on a lot of different opioids which may have affected his thinking, or, you know, maybe he didn't because he probably did have a tolerance after using these drugs for, what, 10 years? But either way, we know that he at least was on drugs at the time of his death. We can't really say how these drugs would have affected his thoughts or behaviors. With most people, if they weren't known to use these drugs already, we can say that they probably really did affect their behaviors and their thoughts. But because Mike had been using these drugs for 10 years, we can't really say how they would have affected his thoughts or feelings, but... This is solid evidence that he was on something when all this took place. He was also found to have four small abrasions on the right side of his neck, and then an abrasion on his right cheek, and then a contusion on his left shoulder. Then in April's autopsy, it was found that she had several bruises on both of her inner thighs, her breasts, and then on her right eye and her right cheek. Again, they found that she had suffered two gunshot wounds, one to the top of her head and then one to her right hand because she was covered the top of her head when she was shot. Then, to top it all off, it was found that Michael's DNA was found under April's fingernails. So basically, what I get from this is that it's saying that the lacerations on the right side of Mike's neck could have been from April scratching him as he was holding her down. It would make sense that she was scratching the right side of his neck as he was holding her with his right arm. And then, you know, it would make sense that she had this laceration to the right side of her face, essentially, because maybe he was holding her against his right shoulder. And then it would make sense that he had this abrasion on his right cheek because he could have been trying to hold her down with his head as well. Or maybe she went back and headbutted him that way. We really can't tell exactly how this went down, but these bruises and abrasions say a lot. Then the other bruises on her breasts and her thighs might show that there was some sort of altercation. Maybe she was pushed. Maybe she was hit in some way. Either way, this also shows a lot. This shows that she wasn't just shot. This shows that someone didn't just run into the room and shoot both of them unexpectedly. 
some sort of altercation went down, there was a struggle. Then even more came out about Mike's behaviors in the months and weeks leading to their deaths. According to a family friend, like I said earlier, Mike had talked to them about how he just could not handle the thought of April seeing somebody else. At the time, it was thought that April wasn't wanting to see anybody else, that she really was just focused on her kids. But a week before this incident, Mike actually found out that April did start a new relationship. According to Madison, when Mike found out about this, he truly just spun into a panic. He freaked out and he was calling her over and over and over again and was just hysterical and crying. And then he kept telling her that he needs her and cannot live without her. Investigators also discovered a letter that Mike had written to April in which he said, I just can't go on knowing that you are with somebody else and it was either me or the both of us. So obviously this confirms that Mike was not handling the separation well at all and clearly he was in a very bad headspace in the week before this took place. Then to top it all off, investigators did find a journal that Mike had kept where he did write about wanting to kill himself. There was no mention about him wanting to kill April, but I think with him already feeling so, so desperate for April in combination with already wanting to kill himself and then top all of these other family problems that he was having on top of that, I think this is reasonable evidence enough to show that Mike could have been the one responsible for taking his own life as well as April's life. But beyond this, there are a few other things that I want to consider. So I do want to note that within a police interview, Madison had asked investigators several times on more than one occasion if he could take a lie detector test to prove his innocence, but they never allowed him to. Then when he was asked about the statements that he made in jail about the girls that he had slept with effing a murderer, Madison's defense basically attributed this to him just being a scared 17-year-old in jail. His defense said that he probably made these statements so that, you know, other inmates would hear it and then maybe he would seem tougher. Obviously, being that he is only 17 and especially if he is innocent, being in jail with other violent offenders is probably terrifying. So the reasoning for this, of course, of just him wanting to seem like he's tougher, I definitely think that that's reasonable. Again, it is really weird. You shouldn't say stuff like that, especially if you want other people to think that you're innocent, but I can definitely see him just being a scared 17-year-old. The most trouble he's ever gotten into is just, you know, using weed and using alcohol and maybe some other drugs that we don't know about, but that's about the extent of it. Now he's being accused of murder. That's probably terrifying. He was also asked about his lack of emotion as all of this was taking place. And he responded to this by basically saying he doesn't know what to say. He was in shock and he genuinely just didn't really know how to act. He said that he was mourning the death of his parents. Yes, but at the same time, he was being accused of a heinous crime. This is something that's brought up in a ton of cases, you know, where someone's just not acting the right way and not acting sad enough and doesn't look devastated enough. But I genuinely think that you cannot judge someone's involvement on a crime based on the emotion that they show. Not everybody reacts the same way. Not everybody is a hysterical mess after seeing something traumatic. I've been in some pretty serious situations that I'm not going to get into, but during some of these situations, I look like the most stoic person that you've ever seen. And it looks like I don't care when in reality, I'm just frozen in fear and I'm trying to process what's happening. I've also had other times where I'm absolutely hysterical in certain situations. So honestly, I can see both sides. I've been the one that people say like, you don't care. You look like you just don't care. Like, how are you not affected by this when really I am? I'm just internalizing it. And then I've had other people being like, whoa, why are you reacting like that? Like, you're a mess, you know? So I see both sides of you know, how you act after something traumatic happens. So that just goes to show that you cannot make a snap decision on someone's guilt just based on how you think they should be acting at any given time. Now, one thing that I could not find any real discussion on is this discrepancy of him saying that he kicked the door open and police saying that there was no damage to the door whatsoever. The only thing that I think can explain this, and this is literally just coming from my head, because again, I have not seen this explained 
anywhere was that maybe they had closed the door and it didn't close all the way or maybe there was like some sort of defective you know doorknob you know sometimes where the door seems closed but the doorknob didn't shut so like the little latch that's in the door didn't close all the way so maybe when he kicked the door open it just came open and it didn't get damaged because it wasn't closed properly that's really the only thing that I can think of, you know, that could attribute this, or maybe he really did bash the door open and it was like a really good quality door. So while, you know, it just came open, nothing broke. I don't really know how to explain that part. I'm not the police. I didn't see the door. So there's not really anything that I could see that explains that. So that's just one question that I still have in this case. The other thing that I want to mention is that there's no mention anywhere in any of the articles that I was able to find that show if Mike's hands were ever tested for gunshot residue. So there's no way to say whether they actually tested him or not. Maybe they did test it and they just didn't mention it, but I tend to lean more towards them just not testing it because it was not mentioned at all. Throughout this entire time over the years, Madison's story has always been consistent and he has never wavered in what he said happened and he has never admitted any sort of wrongdoing. He was presented with different plea deals, but he was adamant that he would not take any plea because he was not about to admit to something that he didn't do because he's adamant that he's innocent. So his trial was set to begin jury selection on October 22nd, 2018. However, just before they were set to start, the prosecution came out to say that they will not be moving forward with these charges. They released a statement which said, quote, District Attorney Randall Houston said, as prosecutors, our job is to find the truth and do justice. When we cannot find the truth, it is impossible to do justice. He confirmed today that murder charges against Jesse Madison Holton of Eclectic have been dismissed. Holton has pled guilty to an underlying charge unrelated to the death of his parents, which is a Class B felony. District Attorney Houston said the forensic report states that this case was a homicide and that position has been maintained. The anticipated testimony of the medical examiner would be that they could not classify this case was a homicide beyond a reasonable degree of medical certainty. From the beginning, this case has been open to interpretation as to what is actually the truth. Either Jesse Holton killed his father and his mother, the father of Jesse Holton killed Jesse's mother and then Jesse killed his father, or the father of Jesse Holton killed Jesse's mother and then killed himself. My office has reason to believe any of these scenarios could have occurred, but we have no proof to support any of these three theories beyond a reasonable doubt. Therefore, we are ethically obligated to dismiss the murder charges against Jesse Holton. Again, we're talking about Madison because he goes by his middle name. The Elmore County Sheriff's Office has left no stone unturned in this case, and I thank them for their relentless search for truth and for justice. The DA said in a press conference that if more evidence develops that shows Madison's involvement beyond a reasonable doubt, that these murder charges could be reinstated. But going through a whole trial, it really can't be undone. If he's found not guilty and more evidence comes out proving his guilt, he can't be retried and he will live his life free being a murderer. But if they found him guilty and more evidence came out to show that he's not guilty, it's really hard to reverse a verdict. And obviously that's more time that he would have spent in jail as an innocent man. The DA went on to say, quote, it's been a very difficult case from the beginning. However, originally the sheriff's department was informed that this was a homicide. I think that's based on the unusual positioning of the bullet wound. The designation of homicide has not changed. However, in preparing the case for trial, the most that they could say is that it's more likely than not that it's homicide. Normally, you'd have blood splatter, DNA, possibly fingerprints. That did not occur in that case. We did have fingerprints, but they were not Jesse Holton's fingerprints. There was blood splatter, but none of it was on Jesse. There was no blood splatter on him at all. We had Jesse engaging in unusual behavior. I don't know if he's just a weird kid. I don't know what it was, but we did have some unusual things that led investigators to question what he was saying. In the end though, the DA says the evidence that they received was more consistent with Jesse's story than with murder. So the charges against him for murder were dropped. He was ultimately indicted on these drug charges from the party, 
but he was sentenced to time served, so he did not have to serve any additional time in jail. Madison's defense attorney would later come out to say that he believes that Mike had shot April and then shot himself. He actually said that Mike's ambidextrous, so it's not impossible that Mike would have used his left hand to shoot himself. Then he discussed the other injuries that both Mike and April had, which showed that Mike had defensive wounds on him, which indicated that he was involved in a struggle. So as we know, Madison did leave jail and he went on to get his GED because he had spent the entirety of his senior year of high school in jail. He said that the biggest thing that got him through his time in jail was actually April's family's support as well as his faith in the Baptist church. He said that he's not mad at the prosecutors besides a select few people that he's upset with. He said that he doesn't actually see his time served in jail as a waste. He actually said that if he wasn't in jail, he probably would have just continued on with his partying and his drug use. He said that he learned a lot during his time in jail and that he's come out as a better person, having learned a lot of valuable lessons. He said that he's put his drug and alcohol use behind him and he actually wants to go to community college and then eventually to law school to become a defense attorney. But for now, I saw that he actually joined the army me, and as far as I last saw, he was stationed in Germany, and now he has a wife named Diana, and that is what he's up to right now. So it's really nice to see that he got something out of his time, you know, in jail for something that he allegedly did not do, and obviously he's happy to be out as well, but he said that there's always this looming fear that the sheriff will one day try to put him back in jail for this, so I do think that's a real concern, but for now, hopefully he's able to live his life and, you know, mend the relationships that he had lost while he was in jail. When he initially came out of jail, he said that he's gonna have to try really hard to get his relationship back with his brothers, but he's willing to do it. He's willing to put in the effort, so. Hopefully something came of that. Hopefully, you know, they were able to get back on track with their family and things like that. But who knows? Obviously, Madison deserves his privacy, so it's not really any of our business. So after reading all of the information in this case, I don't really know why police were so set on pinning this on Madison. One thing that I want to mention is that we know that Mike was known around the town as being a stand-up citizen who was always willing to help his community and he seemed like the amazing and perfect father. But we know that behind closed doors, he struggled with addiction. He struggled with his separation and their family was going through a really difficult time. He struggled with his children and them wanting to, you know, start showing their teen rebellion. And we can't say for sure what could have caused all of this to happen the way that it did. Him suddenly deciding to take his own life and, you know, the life of the mother of his children with one of his children literally sitting in the other room. Especially after seeming very calm and normal to this officer. So I genuinely don't know how all of this could have gone down, but it seemed that something in that moment just snapped and he just thought that this was the opportunity that he had to take and he took it. I think police truly believed at first that Madison was the one responsible because of the things that we discussed earlier, you know, Madison being upset about getting caught, you know, him not wanting to take responsibility for his partying, and then obviously everything else that the family was going through, the fact that he was the only other person there. I do think that they had reason at first to believe it might have been Madison, but after all of these other things came out, I just don't think Think there's enough evidence and obviously there's not enough evidence obviously the prosecutors knew that so this shows that he probably didn't do it and as you guys can tell in my opinion i don't think that madison committed these murders i don't think there's any evidence to show that he did but I'm sure there's still people out there who do think that he's responsible. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think about this entire situation. Obviously, you know, I have my opinion, but I still want to hear what you guys think. So I do still have questions about the strange positioning of the gunshot wound that Mike allegedly self-inflicted. But thinking about the situation and talking about it now, I do think that there's a very reasonable situation that this could have happened. So as we said from before, Madison said that he saw that Mike had April in a headlock. I personally think that if he truly was right-handed and he was stronger on his right side, then he probably wouldn't have used that hand to hold a gun. Instead, he probably would have used his right arm 
to hold down April because if he's stronger on that side, obviously he's going to need the strength on that side to hold somebody down. Then I think that there was a very intense struggle. Maybe April tried to grab the gun. Obviously, there was injuries to show that she was trying to get out of his headlock. So that actually makes sense, I think, why the gunshot wounds were kind of strained. Then again, as we can tell, there was a very serious struggle between the two of them based on the injuries that we saw on both of them. I do think that it's possible that April was trying to grab the gun. So it's possible that if he was holding the gun with his left hand and she was trying to grab it away from him with her, you know, maybe with her right hand, that it got pulled over and instead of letting her have the gun, he shot the gun. So that could also be the reason for the finger having a gunshot wound through it, or maybe they were just struggling and she knew that something was about to happen. So she put her hand on her head and he just did it without really looking at where he was doing it. And then I think that again, because it was in his left hand, because he was using his right hand for other things, that that's why he just went behind his head and did it that way. I don't think that this was thought through. Obviously it wasn't. So I think that this entire situation probably happened within like 10 seconds, 30 seconds at most. Cause the way we explain it, we spend, you know, however long we spend talking about this case. So it seems like this would have been a struggle that takes a long time. I think it happened within literally a couple of seconds. But anyways, I do think that that's how this could have happened. I know that that was kind of a lot, but I kind of just want to explain this for anybody who still doesn't quite get why these gunshot wounds were in such a strange position. The one thing that I cannot wrap my head around is why Mike would do this with his son literally in the other room, still in handcuffs. Clearly, he wasn't thinking. Clearly, in that moment, something happened that just, again, snapped and made him think that this is what he had to do. I don't know. Clearly, he had a gun. I don't know when he grabbed the gun. Maybe he grabbed it, and that's when she started yelling for help. This could have happened in any number of ways, and I can continue to speculate, but I'm sure, you know, you have all of your opinions based on everything that you know. So again, I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think. Let me know and explain how you think this could have gone down in the comments, because I do think this is such an interesting case. I think there's so many ways this could have gone, but at the end of the day, it is my opinion and my stance that I do think that Mike is the one responsible for taking April's life as well as his own. So let me know in the comments, do you think that Madison killed his parents? Do you think that Mike was responsible? If so, how do you think either of these situations went down? That is where I'm going to end my rambling and my explanations of what I think happened. And so I'm really looking forward to the discussion that happens in the comments. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked today's video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, make sure you click the link down below and head over to Native and use code RACHELSHANNON9 to get 33% off of your three pack of Native deodorant or 20% off of any of their other products like their body wash or their toothpaste. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!